Southwestern family of companies welcomes you to the Action Catalyst. Each week, our diversely and amazingly accomplished guests share their insights and inspirations to help us ignite our own. So let's invest attention together to breathe, to reflect and refocus, and decisively defeat that voice we call Mr. Mediocrity. Then let's enjoy moving forward to make a positive difference in our world. Driven by purpose and guided by principles, Southwestern Family of Companies has inspired people to achieve their goals since 1855. Based in Nashville, our family of companies continues to expand rapidly to include members across a wide range of industries that offer products and services to customers around the world. We take great pride in positively impacting the communities that we serve. On this episode of The Action Catalyst, we catch up with Rebecca Costa, a former Silicon Valley executive, sociobiologist, and futurist whose career spans four decades of working with some of the biggest and most groundbreaking names in tech. After serving as the founder and CEO of one of the largest technology marketing firms in California, Costa released the international bestseller, The Watchman's Rattle. She is consistently ranked as one of the top public speakers in the United States and abroad, and brings an evolutionary biologist perspective to the subject of adaptation and adaptive strategies for the 21st century. Well, listeners to the Action Catalyst, this is Dan Moore, and I am personally very excited that we have Rebecca Costa with us today. Rebecca is many things in one human. She is a sociologist. She is a psychologist. She is an economist. She is an entrepreneur. She thinks about the future with her feet firmly grounded in the present, about how we can adapt and adjust, has some amazing concepts we hope to discuss today, particularly impressive to me, the whole notion of being pre-adaptive as opposed to adaptive. So Rebecca, welcome to the Action Catalyst. Well, thank you for having me. I'd love it if you could maybe take a couple of minutes and share some of the most significant pivots in your career, starting out in California, how you ended up working as an entrepreneur, and then how you developed this amazing interest in the future, so much so that people call you a futurist of the likes of some amazing people, Alvin Toffler, Malcolm Gladwell, and so many other amazing people. It's a good question because I don't think anyone starts out saying, I think I want to be a futurist in my career. <laughs> no, it's, not, it's not exactly something you get a degree for. And I think largely my career is like a lot of people in my position where uh, a series of events came together. So uh, the first significant event was um, when I was an undergraduate, I happened to be given a book called uh, Sociobiology. The New Synthesis by Edward O. Wilson. He was a young upstart at Harvard University at that time, and who knew that he was going to become known as the greatest naturalist in the world. But for some reason, that book really caught my attention. So I immediately petitioned the university uh, for a degree in sociobiology, and they said, socio what? Never heard of it. Uh, and in those days, you couldn't have hybrid degrees like you can now. And so they gave me a degree in sociology and biology and called it a day. When I was done with that, it was interesting because here I had a degree in sociology and, and biology, and I wasn't quite sure what that equipped me to do as a job. So I returned home like a lot of students do. My parents happened to buy a house in what was becoming Silicon Valley. At that time, there were just a lot of fruit orchards. And there were some little upstarts like Intel and National Semiconductor and folks like that that were beginning to change the world as we knew it. At that time, nobody had uh, degrees in electronics and, and really understood technology and all that well. So they, they would really hire anybody and they would trade you. And so uh, I wound up getting a job with a smaller company that developed the first CAD-CAM uh, systems. And then from there, you know, the technology boom bit me. But interestingly enough, a sociobiology studies the evolutionary history of human beings and what that foretells about our behaviors in the present and, and in the future. And technology was moving at such a rapid pace that there was a disconnect between what we were as human beings. You know, this biological spacesuit, what its capabilities really are and how it's programmed to operate. And the pace at which technology was moving, and I was right in the middle of that. And so for many years, I kept journals, many, many journals. I had many influencers, people that I worked with like Steve Jobs, Larry Ellison, 
I worked one level below the greatest CEO at at that time, Jack Welch of General Electric. I had worked for people that were great visionaries and very courageous pioneers for their time. And that really infected me with a zest for what was coming. What's going to be the next big disruptor? You know, what's going to change our lives? And is it going to change it for the better or the worse? And that has just been a theme throughout my whole life. It's fantastic. And your openness to these inputs is just remarkable. You know, all great thinkers somehow wind up synthesizing different disciplines, right? Whether it was my background of growing up in Japan and then experiencing the Vietnam War through my father's work, or it was Ed Wilson's perspective that we are biologically, largely biologically driven, uh, even as, as we structure societies or even our individual decisions have a biological component to it. And then being thrust in the middle of this man-machine melt, which is gradually occurring. So unbeknownst to me, I, I, I kind of went from, you know, the jungles of Laos and Vietnam and the, and, the, and the incredible creativity in downtown Tokyo, Japan, to studying biology, to suddenly being thrown in the middle of Silicon Valley. It, for me, it gave me such a passion for knowledge. Mm-hmm. It's your experience, it's your perspective, your knowledge that really creates what is what I call a lifelong learner. Mm-hmm. And for me, you know, I, th- this is a funny story. I was invited to a cocktail party and a man was talking about septic tanks and these new environmentally friendly septic tanks. And I was very interested in his concept. And eventually, of course, my, my partner, who I was there with, tapped me on the shoulder and said, you, you have to socialize. It's a cocktail party. You're in the corner talking about septic tanks. That's not <laughs> appropriate. <laughs> I said, but it's so interesting what, you know, his concept is, you know, but I, I am a lifelong learner. I'm a, I'm a junkie for anything new. Oh, I think it's, it's fantastic. I wish you could share a little bit about what was behind the Watchman's Rattle. Amazing book. And all I've done is done some previewing of it. Very much looking forward to reading the entire book. And what has changed in how you view things since that was published, I guess, about 14 or so years ago? Well, that's what got me the title Futurist. And I need to tell people, I don't talk to dead people and I don't read tarot cards. Uh, You know, there are no facts about the future, only probabilities. And so I rely strictly on trends and statistical analysis, basically predictive analytics, to make forecasts of what, what's, what are the most likely events to occur. You mentioned my book, The Watchman's Rattle. I have been keeping journals, incessant journals, about this bifurcation that was occurring between what humans were designed to do and how we were designed to function and where technology was taking us. And I could see this acceleration in data and day-to-day complexity, just the degree to which we knew where our water was coming from or that we could fill out our own taxes. You know, there were layers and layers of complexity that were just a byproduct of this technological revolution. And I've been keeping journals for a really long time. So I had uh, the benefit of starting a company uh, on my own in Silicon Valley. And once I was able to sell that, I retired to the hills of Big Sur just to get away from everything. And one day while I was moving things, I found boxes and boxes of these journals. And I sat down just, you know, on the ground and started reading them. And I said, there is something here. There's a smell to it. Mm -hmm. And that's where the book came from. When I looked at everything, I realized that there is a pattern that occurs in societies. What happens is when societies first start out, like the Mayan civilization, for example, there is a coexistence of unproven beliefs and empirical facts. And you could tell the difference between what is an empirical fact and what is just a belief. So using the Mayans as an example, they might have practiced fetishism to bring on the rain so that they could have abundant crops. But at the same time, they were practicing water conservation Uh, They were building underground cisterns to store their food. They were very mindful. They they actually were phenomenal hydraulic engineers. 
They were building dams and reservoirs and everything that were unprecedented for their time. But what happens is, is that social complexity starts to accelerate and move at a faster and faster rate. This phenomenon occurs where the person on the street can no longer tell the difference between what is a proven empirical fact and what is an unproven belief. Things are too complex to be able to make that discernment. And then the third stage that occurs is unproven beliefs begin to filter in and shape public policy. And once that third stage is reached, all it takes is some cataclysmic event and the entire society collapses very quickly, as in the Mayan society. So you see this with the Mayans in that as the drought conditions got worse and worse, they abandoned building reservoirs, no more underground cisterns, no more water crop rotation. They started escalating the sacrifice of human beings. Originally, they, they were only sacrificing captured prisoners from other tribes. Then they moved on to the old and the infirm. Then they moved on to newborns in order to bring the rain. They exclusively relied on unproven beliefs. And you can see that shift actually occur in the Roman Empire, the Egyptian Empire, the Ming Empire has followed this pattern. So what I did 15 years ago was say, well, where are we? I documented every source material that I used because this was a controversial theory. This relationship between complexity and collapse had never been made before. And it was a very controversial theory. And believe me, I got a lot of pushback on it. And I think it's important for our listeners to note, you wrote this about 15 years ago. And without revealing your age, I'm going to say, let's say it's the term mid-century at that point. So you're not exactly an overnight success as an author. But that's kind of one of the whole lessons here, Rebecca, that, that we hope people will, will take from this. It's so easy to talk to somebody that is a world change and a world impactor as you are, and to imagine that things just naturally unfolded for that person, that it just one day they had this stroke of luck and good things happened. You know better than that. You know different than that. So I wonder if you could share some insights about maybe a time when you hit a career brick wall. What, what are some observations in terms of personal life management that you could share that could help our listeners? Well, I have had many of those situations. There are a millions of reasons to give up. You know, I may sound like a very confident person. One thing I've discovered about myself is that I'm not particularly confident. I'm not confident in my ideas. Many times I'm, I'm at a speaking engagement and I might be speaking to 5,000 people who have paid a lot of money to hear from me. And just before I, you know, peek through the curtain and see everyone taking their seats, and I think, what could I possibly tell them, right? They would equal the value in this room. These are brilliant people. But here is the thing. I don't care how I feel about things. I, I know that particularly you and I, we're from a generation where you're supposed to pay attention to your feelings. Mm. But your feelings aren't always going to guide you in the right direction. Your prefrontal cortex, which is the logic part of your brain, is a better judge of what you should do. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's going to look at the facts and say, you know, it's probably good that you don't go out on stage and say, you know, I really don't have anything to tell all of you that would be of any value. And then just, you know, turn into a little scared mouse. That's probably not a good idea. Probably not. Right. A better idea is they actually know your background. They've read your material. They've, they've looked at your speeches. They, they understand your content. Now go give them something they haven't heard from you yet. Go give them everything you have. Leave it all on the stage. Now, this is the interesting thing. I may seem like I'm very extroverted when I'm on the stage. That also isn't how I feel. How I feel when I'm done giving a presentation is I am absolutely exhausted. And when I'm done, I can't wait to go to my hotel room, pour myself a hot bath and be alone. I am a forced extrovert because being an introvert wasn't going to get me where I needed to get. So again, it's not how I feel. I'm an introvert, but in order to get to where I want to go, I have to develop extrovert skills. I have to master those so that I can communicate with the public and I can get the, these ideas and this information out there. So while your feelings, you have to have respect for them and you have to be honest, intellectually honest about who you are and how you feel about things, I don't think you can let that guide your decisions. So self-awareness is a huge part of this, knowing yourself and knowing that you can shift gears into a different mode when it's called for. 
it's funny, about seven or eight years ago, I read the book by Susan Cain called Quiet. The subtitle of the book is The Power of Introverts in a World that Cannot Stop Talking. And I was reading the book in, in our family room, and I sat bolt upright and announced to my wife, I'm an introvert right here. Now I get it. And isn't it interesting that you're an introvert and I'm an introvert, and yet we have a public venue because we know that the thoughts that we're having, the information we have, the talents we have are meant to be shared. Amen to that. Now, that's fascinating. I think it's great. Now, I want to come back to something you said a few moments ago that you, you realized and you embraced the fact you're a lifelong learner. What is it that causes you to keep growing? What causes you to not flatten out and become complacent? I don't know. Like, I think it just might be that it's so exciting. Everything that's happening to us in life is just exciting. And for the most part, it hasn't happened before. I, I mean, even the coronavirus, you know, when I started to get reports from people that I knew in China, you know, and they were sending me lab reports and so on and so forth. I couldn't get enough of it. And I, I was sounding the alarm very, very early in February or March and saying, this is, this is not something that this virus isn't behaving the way viruses behave in the natural world. There's something very specific and special about this virus. And so it doesn't really matter to me whether it's septic tanks that are more environmentally friendly or it's a new virus that's coming out or it's um, MIT developing a device that will allow people who can't communicate to communicate because you say a word in your head before you speak it. It's called subvocalization, and it can vocalize that word. I've actually said that will be the end of all marriages. Now that we, <laughs> now that we can vocalize what you're thinking, it's all over. Um, but, you know, I, 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 it's, there's so many things happening all over the world. And to be in a position where people are sending me material on a constant basis, 24-7 from all over the world, and to be able to consult with the world's largest corporations and have visibility into their research and development departments where it's happening is just such a privilege. Mm -hmm. You spoke about the brick walls in your own life. I, I was moved by something in a recent presentation you did where you spoke about types of failure, quoting James Hunt and the seven types of failure. And the theme that you pulled out of that is fail early, fail often. But in our society, there's not a lot of glorification of the notion of failing. It is uh, looked upon as somehow falling short, not getting things right. When I have failed, uh, it's been very hard for me to move forward. There's a harshness in me. Maybe that harshness propels me not to fail as often as I would if I were okay about it. I'm not okay about it, but I have to forgive myself. I have to forgive myself or I'm never going to get past that. Mm -hmm. And and by the way, I am so imperfect. I insist on failing at the same thing at least twice just to make sure the first time was a failure. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of scientist I am. I'm going, well, you know, there were a lot of variables there that may not necessarily have been a failure. And then the second time I fail, I go, yeah, yeah, that was the right thing. So I have learned to not only forgive myself the first time I fail, but to give myself permission to try it again, just to make sure. So, so there you have it. Um, I have failed in things in my personal life. I have failed at projects that I had. I have had ideas that I thought would reach this level and, and came in far short. I've had slews of disappointments, but there is something that's uh, an eternal optimist in me that says, that's okay because it's all getting rolled up. There's a man in the back of my head or woman that's rolling this all together. And somehow that is making me a better human and a better contributor to society. There's a lot of wisdom in what you just shared there, Rebecca. I personally am encouraged by that. And particularly the whole idea of self-forgiveness, self-awareness, failing is okay. There's actually progress through imperfection that people often don't recognize. And I think that's remarkable. I've become a better human being because of my failures. And I will tell you that my biggest failures came much later in life. When I was younger, I was kind of, you know, blamey. Mm -hmm. You know, when people would have failures, I'd say, well, they should have seen this and this and this, and then they made this decision. 
and and I I would inflict the responsibility on the person. Largely, I thought failure was earned because I hadn't had failure. But once I had failure, I realized, wow, that's too harsh. Yeah. And that is really important for people who are struggling right now. They didn't earn the COVID shutdown. You didn't cause that to happen. You may have made some decisions along the way that unfortunately put you on the bad side of that shutdown, right? The negative side, the failure side of it. But you didn't cause that. And it's really important to embrace that because otherwise it's too harsh. Very harsh. One can be caught up in it, but not be the cause of it. That's right. Very, very, very powerful. Unfortunately, I have to wrap this up, but your whole notion about being pre-adaptive as opposed to being adaptive, it's based upon the fact that we have more information than we've ever had before. We have better prediction tools. They come to this information much more rapidly. What about individuals, not so much companies or societies? What do you think individual people can do so that we as people are more pre-adaptive and not just reactive and adaptive? Well, we have to remember from a biological standpoint, this spacesuit is only designed to respond to whatever's in front of us. So if I throw a snake in front of you, you either flee or you want to kill the snake, right? If I talk to you about something that's going to happen later this afternoon that's threatening or, or worrisome, you have some biological reaction. You know, you, your heart may pitter-patter a little bit faster, but not much faster. If it's tomorrow, maybe no biological change. But if it's things that are months out, years out, pretty much you don't have any biological reaction. Your body isn't flooded with chemicals to take action. This is the great problem because by the time you know that something needs to change, right? By the time you hear the information, you're too late today. The train has already left the station and you're not on it. You have to look at what's coming and start to prepare yourself now. And it's a big challenge. It's, if you talk to a 25-year-old about saving for retirement, their eyes gloss over. Mm -hmm. You don't try to sell life insurance to 19-year-olds, even though they should buy life insurance because it's really cheap. This is the problem, the fundamental biological problem that we have. And so for most of the time when I'm talking to people, I'm saying, well, what do you imagine will happen? What about your job? Do you think your job will be there next year, five years? 10 years from now, 20 years from now, how will it change? Will it even exist? What skills do you suppose you need, right? This is the kind of thing that you have to begin thinking about now. Where you live relative to climate change, where should you be living? Are you going to wait until there's no water and the earth is burning before you move or do you move now? You know, you, you really want to start thinking about these things far in the future and then make them actionable today. Even if you're just taking a small action, like I'm going to research places that climatologists think will be okay in terms of available water, you know, what their best models predict. Or, you know, I'm going to, uh, you know, I, I mean, whatever it is, I'm going to start develop, taking online classes because I think robotics is going to be a big field, even though I don't know anything about robotics. I'm going to start a class today. Mm -hmm. do something, even though it's going to be small, take some baby steps now, because this is really critical that you cannot wait and then think that you're going to flip the switch. Flipping the switch never worked for human beings and it doesn't work now. No, particularly with the, uh, the race between complexity going up and time going down that you speak about so much. Boy, this is so chock full of good stuff here, Rebecca. I have really enjoyed this conversation. It's, it's just been a wonderful day. Well, I'm so glad to hear that. I know our listeners appreciate it. I do personally as well. Let's keep growing and let's keep contributing. And thank you so, so much for being on the Action Catalyst. Thank you. And thank you for the good work you're doing. If you enjoy this podcast, please make sure to subscribe. To stay updated on everything that the Action Catalyst is up to, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Action Catalyst Podcast and Twitter at Catalyst underscore Action. Thanks for listening.